to makeup presentation number two. Uh, go ahead and pour yourself a cup of coffee and make yourself comfortable. And um, yeah, this is actually a pretty good chapter to uh, to do in kind of a non classroom setting because it is rather detached from the rest of the lectures. Uh, everything that we've been studying is Western art. And this is our really one and only lecture on, if I may use the phrase, non-Western art, which is art created um, from cultures that uh, were not, well, European or uh, American. Uh, and this means that we kind of have to shift our focus a little bit. Uh, rather than knowing the artist, the title, the style, um, as you can see down there, I want you to know which culture or which tribe, you might say, created the objects that we're looking at. Uh, I want you to know what it is. And I want you to know uh, what the object was used for. And uh, the next two slides I'm going to show you aren't on the test, but I think it does kind of put us in a nice mindset of being able to approach uh, the art of cultures which are uh, just so different from us in so many ways. All right, so let's start by looking at some works of art from the African continent. And um, you'll notice that all of these little marks here, uh, they all come from uh, the western side of the continent. And this is the case if you go to a museum that has a collection of African art, um, it always tends to be from the western side. And this is not at all to say that cultures on the eastern side of Africa did not produce great objects. It's because, um, well, westerners just had more contact with western um, with the western ridge of the African continent. Uh, there was a lot of trading going on. Uh, m many of these countries uh, wound up being colonies of, say, Portugal and France and uh, England and uh, the Netherlands, too. And uh, part of that trade involved uh, trading of their objects. Uh, so this is, by the way, how they wound up in the west in the first place. Uh, and incidentally, the very first uh, work of art that we're going to be looking at is here in the kingdom of Benin. Now, if you're at all familiar with African countries, you'll know that there is a country called Benin. I'm not talking about that country. I'm talking about the kingdom, the court of Benin, which is in modern day Nigeria. So let's take a look at a work of Benin art. OK, so here's one of the uh, more common objects that you would see coming out of the court of Benin. Uh, which was um, an actual legitimate kingdom. Uh, they can trace their lineage all the way back to the 13th century, but they really uh, flourished in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, so, uh, as you can see here, this is just simply known as a Benin head. Uh, it is made out of metalwork, um, specifically some sort of bronze alloy. Uh, this is a, a hollow wax cast sculpture, meaning that this is a lost wax sculpture made of bronze. And as you can see, it's about nine inches all around. Um, now, the reason why this is such a common sight in uh, coming out of the court of Benin is because this is a very important person we're looking at. Uh, this is an Oba, uh, or in their language, a king. And uh, this is a very typical uh, thing to see in uh, the honor, the cult of the Oba. Um, now, the reason why it's a head is not because it's meant to be a portrait. This isn't what the Oba looked like. Rather, it's just a head. Um, there are a lot of proverbs in the Abedin culture about, about your head. Uh, your head leads you through life's journeys. Uh, the burden to provide for your family is placed on your head. Uh, the Oba was known as the Great Head. So if they had similar uh, sayings about, say, feet, then you'd probably see a lot of works of art depicting uh, people's feet. And uh, that's kind of what this is, uh, and that is a head. Now, uh, like I said, it is uh, made out of bronze. But if you take a close look, there's a lot of indications of um, one of the chief deities of the Benin Kingdom, and that is Olokun. Uh, Olokun is the Benin uh, god of the sea and the king of the gods. And so Olokun 
and the Oba were very much connected. Uh, they were just kind of seen as sort of a special link to the divine. Uh, and as you can see here, they considered the sea to be the realm of the dead or the realm of the ancestors. They felt about the sea the way we might think about uh, the sky as being where the afterlife is. That's kind of how they felt about uh, the ocean. And uh, Olokun is also the god of wealth and creativity. And that is why you see this patterning all over the Oba's head. Uh, those are coral beads. So here, I think you can see my pointer. Um, as a matter of fact, here, let me turn on the laser pointer. There we go. Okay. So this patterning that you see on his crown, uh, there are strings of beads going down the front and behind his ear, and also close coils of coral coming right up to the underside of his jaw. Uh, those are all meant to be coral beads, and as you probably know, coral comes from um, the ocean. So hence, there's still a connection uh, with Olokun in the fact that the uh, that this head is shown as having uh, coral beads all over it. And uh, this happens to be one of the chief exports of the Benin Kingdom, which is how they are able to thrive uh, through the trade of these beautiful and valuable beads. Now, um, one of the things also to know about this Oba head is that uh, this would have been created after the Oba had died. Uh, whenever uh, the Oba's son would take over, one of his first duties as, as the new Oba was to create and commission a head of his father and then put it together on an altar dedicated to his uh, memory. And I'm going to show you an altar uh, right here. So uh, this is an altar dedicated to the memory of one of the Obas. Um, now, this is a much, much later uh, altar. And uh, in case you're curious, these Benin heads uh, show some more of the abstraction and stylization that you would see later in the Benin kingdom, with the coral beads going right up to the level of the chin and the face getting a little squashed. But I also like to show this because um, you can see that originally there would have been elephant tusks placed inside of the Oba heads. I don't know if you noticed, but the top of his head in the previous slide was a little bit flat. So originally there would have been um, a tusk coming out of that. Uh, elephants are associated uh, with power and authority, and they're also one of the um, main sources of the Benin wealth uh, through the harvesting of ivory. And ivory is also associated with Olokun, uh, because of just the power and the strength. And also, Olokun is associated often uh, with the color of white. And that's going to lead us nicely into this next work of art from the same kingdom. This is still the court of Benin. And as you can see, this is another head. But what's different about it is that rather than being uh, a bronze head that would have been placed on the altar, uh, this head is made out of ivory. It has these sort of uh, metalwork plugs there inside the head, and there's also a bit of metalwork um, in the eyes, and the eyeliner, if you will. Now, this object is called a pendant mask, but I find that that, may, that might be a little bit misleading because this wasn't meant to be worn on the face. Um, as you can see, there are no uh, eye holes for it. Uh, rather, I'm not sure if you can see, but uh, above and below her ear, there are these sort of like little loops right here. And those would have had bits of leather strung through them. And you were actually meant to wear this object uh, on your waist or possibly on your chest. So it would have been strapped to your torso, not again worn on your face. So again, mask might be a bit misleading. All right. Now, um, one way that, is, that this is different from the previous Benin head is that uh, you wouldn't know just by looking at it, but this is actually dedicated not to an Oba, but to a queen, uh, specifically uh, Edia. This was made uh, by uh, Edia's uh, son, uh, Asiji. And uh, this probably was worn during uh, ceremonies to commemorate her memory. Oh, by the way, if you're scrambling to write those names down, don't worry about it. Um, but I want to point out what's also typical of the Benin. Uh, first of all, it's made out of ivory, which you saw was uh, one of the objects that came out of the Benin heads. And as I said, ivory is associated with their principal deity. Uh, he's the god of creativity, wealth, purity. 
And uh, if you look closely, you can see that there are strings of coral beads going around her chin as well. And there's also a bit of beadwork there at the bottom of that curious flourish at the top and bottom of her head. And that's what I want to point out next. Can you guess what we're looking at here? What these are meant to be stylizations of? Uh, I don't know if you guess, but um, they are two different creatures. Uh, these are salamanders, or if you will, mudfish or mud skippers. And uh, the reason why you would see salamanders or mud skippers on here is because those are also associated in sort of a roundabout way with the Oba and with Olokun, the god of the sea, because, well, salamanders, they can live in the ocean or um, in the water and out of it. Uh, they're also very powerful creatures. They've got a bite that'll really sting if they get, a, if they get their hooks into you. And um, they're meant to be indicative of the king's uh, authority and his power. But what I find really interesting are these carvings um, that are interspersed every other space. Uh, those are actually Portuguese men. Um, I don't know if you can see, but those are their eyes. This is a nose. This is his mustache. Uh, this is his hair. And there's also a, hel a helmet on top of his head. And I find that really interesting because uh, we kind of have this stereotype of Africa as being completely isolated, just completely um, uh, just set apart from the rest of the world, living in uh, huts in the middle of the Sahara or something. But that's not at all the case of the uh, Benin Kingdom. They were a very powerful, very wealthy kingdom. And one of the ways that they uh, extended their authority was through trade with Portugal. And um, consider what we know about the Benin court and about their religion, how they felt about the sea, um, and how Olokun is associated with, well, the color of white, and is associated uh, with wealth and power. And so uh, you can imagine what it must have been like whenever suddenly over the sea comes this curious vessel filled with these noticeably paler-skinned individuals. Uh, we know of them as people from Portugal uh, who were uh, just kind of out exploring, but uh, for them, it's not like they were worshipped as gods or anything like that, but they were held in uh, very high esteem, and they brought wealth, and they brought objects, and they helped to trade with the Benin. And so you see uh, these Portuguese men appearing in African statuary coming out of the Benin court, which I find very curious to see uh, what their conceptions of uh, Westerners were, what uh, of Europeans looked like. And um, yeah, so the main exports of the Benin kingdom uh, included, of course, coral, bronze, ivory, and uh, unfortunately, slaves, um, part of their expansion of the kingdom included uh, capturing human shadow from uh, within the continent and uh, trading as part of the, uh, the global slave trade, which is unfortunate. Um, as for the kingdom itself, uh, unfortunately, it was burned down. Uh, the British destroyed their palace in 1897. Uh, there's still a ruin left in Nigeria, but uh, nothing much to speak of except for these uh, splendid objects, which are now scattered in uh, museums well, all over the world. Uh, this particular object, um, this is a different culture, so we're no longer in the Benin culture. Rather, this was created, as you can see, by the Yambe people down in the, uh, the Republic of the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And um, this is one of my favorite objects. I just think this thing is just so interesting. Uh, now, we're looking at uh, a wooden figure. As you can see, he's uh, a little under three feet tall, and um, he is just bristling with these nails and these curious protrusions coming out of his entire chest. And uh, whenever you look at him, you see a wooden doll, if you will, a wooden figure covered in nails. And your first thought might be, ah, this is a voodoo doll. I know what this is. Uh, well, actually, uh, it's not. They were misinterpreted as voodoo dolls uh, for a long time. But uh, the real use of this object is, I think, much more interesting. Uh, this figure is called Mangaka, which uh, in their language would translate to uh, justice or jurisprudence. Uh, this figure is meant to personify and represent the force of 
justice, and that's what mangaka is, the force of, um, of judicial wrath. Uh, this is also sometimes called an oath taking figure or a promise taking figure. And uh, so what you would do is if uh, me and somebody else in the uh, in the culture, in the Yambet culture, would have had uh, an agreement, like say, I owe somebody a lot of money, but I can't pay them back right now, I'll pay you back whenever my crop comes in. And then the person would agree to those terms. And in a Western culture, the two of us would draw up a contract and both put our signatures on it. Uh, but what they would do here in the Yambet culture is both of us would come up to the mangaka figure, to the figure of justice. And we would drive a nail into its torso. And that nail that we drove into it, that represents our promise. And by driving it into the wood of the sculpture, we are driving it directly into the judicial force of the culture. Uh, I even read that sometimes they would both take turns uh, licking or spitting on the nail before they drove it in. And uh, I included two pictures. Uh, these are actually two different sculptures. Uh, the one in the center here is from a uh, museum in Berlin, and I couldn't find any better pictures of it, so uh, I did find some splendid slides of uh, a mangaka figure from the Met here in New York City. And I included that uh, to show you what this figure would have looked like from sort of a 360 degree angle. Uh, he's very intimidating. Uh, his eyes are wide and bright. Uh, sometimes they would even have the eyes inlaid with shells so that they flash and shine. Uh, his lips are parted and his teeth are bared. You can see he kind of has these uh, broken teeth looking out at us. He's not smiling. He looks kind of menacing. Uh, he has his hands on his hips, his feet are apart, and he is leaning forward ever so slightly to meet our gaze. And this was meant to be intimidating because if I make a promise to this statue, I better keep it because if I don't, the actual figure of justice, uh, not, the, not the figure itself, but the force of justice, the mangaka, could actually come and get me if I break my word. So uh, by driving a nail into this figure, well, I am making a very clear promise to this statue, to the other person, and to everyone else in the community that I am going to uh, be held to my word. Uh, let's take a look at the close-up of uh, the face. And again, uh, the close-up I'm going to show you is of this statue in the Met, not the one that's in your textbook, but uh, it'll do. Yeah, so again, you can see that his uh, lips are parted and his teeth are showing. Um, those strange protrusions coming out of his face, uh, there originally would have been this sort of terracotta beard uh, sticking onto its face, but in this case, uh, the beard is broken off. Uh, but you can see again that his teeth are bared, his eyes are wide, and he wears a, uh, a cap that identifies him as a priest, as a sort of a holy figure. Uh, but what I also wanted to call your attention to is something that you may have noticed. He has this strange uh, opening in his chest, and that originally was packed full of important objects, uh, especially dirt and soil from ancestral grave sites. They would take that dirt and mix it together with other medicines and special herbs that act as sort of a magnet pulling the force of justice to the figure. And then uh, whenever it was packed full of this dirt and these medicines, they would have capped it up and sealed it. And that way, whenever you drive a nail into it, you really are driving a promise into the heart of the figure of justice. But it's empty now. And that's part of its history because, well, now they're in museums. This one's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, the other one is in a museum in Berlin in Germany. And so whenever these collectors came to Africa and they took these objects back to their museums, uh, the culture, the Yambe, they would actually take the cap off and empty the soil out. And it's almost like you took the batteries out. Uh, it went from being a force of justice to nothing but an empty wooden statue which is what it is today, but originally this would have had uh, real significance and use to their culture. Uh, hundreds of uh, pieces of uh, metal and nails are driven into this piece, and that's a lot of promises that were made to this uh, sculpture. I think he's pretty awesome. I'd like to maybe have one of these in my house if I ever have any kids and they say they'll wash the car and they don't. Um, this is what's going to come and get you if you don't keep your word. Okay, 
And now we're going to take a little journey over to uh, Ghana. And um, in the country of Ghana, one of their, uh, you might say, more traditional works of art and creations is a type of cloth called kente. And uh, the thing about kente cloth, uh, it does kind of fit with our, if you will, stereotypical view of what African clothing looks like. It's very colorful and it has this wonderful, bright, fun pattern. But uh, the actual use of kente is a bit more significant. It's not just something uh, lovely that you wear. It's something that means things. Um, and kente is woven in strips. As you can see down here, it's a strip weave. And so it's almost like a bunch of long scarves sewn end to end. And you can see here underneath the kente, it has uh, something in quotes. This is what the cloth means. Whenever you wear kente in Ghana, you're not just wearing a bit of cloth, something pretty. It's actually a message that you're communicating to other people within the culture. Uh, there's a certain type of kente that you would wear on Sunday. There's a certain type of kente that you would wear uh, if you were pregnant or if you had just given birth or uh, if you were an old woman or if you were newly married. There's lots of different patterns and colors all of which could be read by members of the community. The particular meaning of this kente that we're looking at is mida, which means something that has not happened before. So you would wear this cloth to commemorate something rare, a wonderful and rare event. In this case, this particular piece of kente was worn by this man, Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, he was the, uh, the first president, the first elected president of Ghana uh, before, well, after it was a British colony. Uh, he opposed colonialism and he was jailed for it. Whenever he was released from jail, this is the cloth that he wore, um, something that has never happened before. And he continued to wear kente throughout his uh, rule as president, and he was very, uh, very aware of what the kente meant, and also how to wear it. So as you can see there, uh, I have a little link for you. So if you're curious on how to wear kente, uh, go ahead and click on that. All right, so kente is worn over the left hand shoulder, never the right hand. And the longer it is, the more important you are to the culture. This is a very long piece of kente. And uh, this is a close up of what kente cloth uh, looks like. And I do believe that this is the same, if not the same cloth that we're looking at before, at least the same pattern, something that has never happened. Uh, but you can see very faintly the little stitches. Uh, holding these long pieces together. Uh, it takes quite a lot of time to weave just one of these cloths. Uh, so, yeah, you wouldn't wear this just for fun and games. You would wear this during very significant events. And as a matter of fact, kente is still used in Ghana. Uh, occasionally, uh, people in Ghana might wear the full regalia, a full, long piece of kente cloth. Uh, but also, they've adapted kente in the strip weave into more modern fashions, as you can see there on the lower left-hand side. That's a bit of a dated photograph, but you can see that uh, the woman's bridesmaid's dresses have kente integrated into them. Uh, this gentleman is wearing a kente uh, necktie. And uh, these graduates, uh, they're part of the Ghanaian uh, fraternity and sorority. And the stoles that they wear upon graduation are strips of kente that are specific to, uh, to their fraternity, to their school. And I think it's very interesting to see how uh, kente is still being adapted into uh, its modern life. And this is also just to show you that uh, our idea of art and fashion is sometimes not consistent with uh, what these objects were initially used for. Now, to leave behind uh, Africa, we're going to take a look at Oceania. And uh, I find Oceania is kind of an unsatisfactory term. It's a little broad, uh, but then again, Africa is a very broad term as well. Uh, but basically, Oceania refers to the Pacific Islands cultures. Um, Australia, New Zealand, the Hawaiian Islands, Easter Islands. Uh, these are all uh, uh, within the overall region of Oceania. Uh, the first work of art that we're going to look at is, uh, well, it comes from the Solomon Islands in Melanesia. Uh, something to know just kind of generally about a lot of oceanic cultures is that they believe that objects can hold a spiritual power called mana. 
and um, many times objects were made to hold mana and to sort of placate the ancestors. Uh, also consistent with a lot of their, uh, with a lot of these cultures, is the belief that everything in the world was created from a union between uh, the father sky and the mother earth. And um, as we'll see in a moment here, also something common uh, to these cultures is what uh, their art is made of. Uh, no real metal deposits in this part of the world. Uh, also clay deposits are hard to find of. So uh, most of the objects that we see are made out of wood and bone and stone and therefore are uh, rather brittle and tend to not survive until after colonialism. But anyway, um, yeah, like I said, this fellow here is from the Solomon Islands, um, and I think that he's awesome. I love this sculpture. And something that's kind of surprising is whenever I look at this sculpture, he looks really good on a large scale. I'm used to seeing this guy, you know, in a classroom blown up onto uh, a large screen. But in reality, as you can see, it's only six and a half inches tall. That's just a little bit bigger than your hand which surprises me. I don't know what it is, but there's just something about uh, the character of his face and his head that, I don't know, he just seems like he should be on a big scale. But anyhow, as you can see that uh, he's made out of wood. It's a carved sculpture um, with inlaid mother of pearl, which is uh, the sort of flashing part of a shell. All right, and you've probably noticed uh, he's holding something in his hands. Uh, that's a bird. And um, he's holding it very gently. That's another thing I love about this sculpture. Uh, if I was holding a bird, that's how I would hold it. He's not grabbing it. He's not crushing it in his hands, but very lightly holding it in the tips of his fingers. And uh, the interesting thing about this object is that I think he's awesome. I, I would want to display this in my house as a work of art. But if you take a look at the annotations, you can see that it's actually not... Uh, intended just for us to look at. This is uh, meant to go on the prow of a canoe. So uh, if you think of like, um, I don't know, English ships with a mermaid on the prow, that's kind of what this guy is, uh, only on a much smaller scale. Um, now he was put on the front of a war canoe as, as you can see, a protective figure. He's there to make sure that the people inside the canoe are safe. Uh, he looks straight ahead, his eyes are open, and he's keeping it up, his eyes peeled uh, to make sure that they don't run into any trouble. And that bird is looking down. Um, the bird is making sure that the canoe doesn't run aground or get tangled up in roots or scrape up against a rock and get a leak or anything like that. So both of these figures are working together to make sure that the people in the war canoe come home safe. And the reason why it's a bird is not just uh, for the sake of being cute. Um, like I said, they believe in the union of the sky father and earth mother is what created the world. And therefore, an animal that can sort of transcend both of those realms, the sky world and the earth world, well, it's very significant to them. Uh, birds are kind of like messengers. They can carry messages uh, from uh, the earth into the sky. And uh, that's why this object, again, has very... Um, certain spiritual significance to the culture. Now, I don't have any information on the specific culture, if you were waiting to write that down. I don't have, uh, for instance, the name of the tribe. So just knowing this as an example of art from Oceania, uh, that'll do it for me. I wish I could find out more information on this object, and um, unfortunately I couldn't, but he was just too good to leave behind. I think he's super. I love those earplugs, by the way. Aren't those great? All right, but here is a specific culture, the Maori culture. And as I have already explained, the Maori are the indigenous culture of New Zealand. And what we're looking at here is something that you would see in a traditional uh, Maori community, a mare, or if you will, a meeting house. And uh, the thing about meeting houses in the Maori community um, they were sort of like a civic building. Uh, these weren't places where people would uh, live uh, day to day and, you know, cook and eat and sleep. Uh, rather, this is a place um, that was sort of the center of their community. 
Uh, the mare is where you would gather together to discuss uh, important uh, issues to your culture, to your community. Uh, this might be a place of uh, ritual rites of passage and to honor your ancestors. And the building itself is honoring uh, an ancestor, uh, one specific person uh, whose name I'm going to attempt to pronounce, but I'm probably not going to do properly, Ruate Papuke. Um, now, the thing about this house, I'll call him Mr. R, because I don't think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, this house, this mare, is meant to represent uh, Mr. R. Um, so this is, uh, these are like his arms and his legs, the posts of the house. Uh, the rafters are his ribs, uh, the beam of the house, that's his spine. And uh, whenever you come inside, you are in a very real sense, entering the presence of your ancestors. And you also probably noticed all these pairs of eyes looking out at you. Um, well, these are eyes of figures, and as you can see, there's dozens of them all over the inside and outside of the building. Uh, let's take a close-up look. Uh, so these figures, they have wonderful swirling patterns on their faces, and uh, many of them have inlaid eyes. This is why they show up well in that flash photograph, kind of whenever you take a flash picture of, uh, of an animal, their eyes kind of flash back at you. You can see that their eyes are wide open, uh, their mouths are open too, and they're sticking their tongues out, this sort of grimacing gesture. Uh, they also have these wonderful uh, decorative lines all over their faces. So this is very, very traditional of many um, Maori cultural aspects. Uh, the Tamoko facial tattooing, for example, and also uh, the haka. Uh, I don't know if you watch any international sports, uh, but the New Zealand uh, football team, well, or if you will, the soccer team, uh, and the rugby team, before they, uh, before they play, they perform a haka, which is a kind of like a, almost like a war dance. Uh, if you've ever seen the videos where they uh, slap their knees and smack their chests and stomp their feet and stick out their tongues, um, this is, that's a haka, and it's meant to sort of intimidate their, uh, their enemies, uh, usually the rugby team on the other side of the field. And uh, that's what these figures are doing. They're intimidating you. Whenever you come into this structure, boy, you better mind your P's and Q's because your ancestors are looking at you. Uh, the building itself has a very interesting uh, provenance. Uh, it was made, um, well, obviously in uh, New Zealand first. Uh, but curiously, uh, even though it was made in the late 1800s, um, it was sold to a German museum in 1902, uh, roof rafters and all. The entire building was just packaged up and sold to Germany. Um, they out, uh, they deaccessioned it in 1905. They sold it to the Field Museum in Chicago for $5,000. And uh, they put it on display in 1924. And whenever they put it on display in Chicago, it was intended to look like a typical Maori home. And they put these... Um, with these dioramas inside, they had these mannequins dressed up and like a guy holding a spear and there was a woman cooking food and she was holding a baby and it was just meant to look like, um, you know, your average Maori home and you could look in through the windows and see what their house would have looked like. But of course, that's not at all what this Maori was used for. It was never intended to be a, a familial structure. This is the center of their community. And uh, eventually they realized and they were approached by members of the Maori community that, look, this is not what this object was used for. Um, you know, and they realized that they were being disrespectful in a sense. And so they ended up um, shutting it down and they took out those silly little mannequins. And um, they did something pretty remarkable. Uh, they opened it to the public. You can actually come inside. And that's pretty cool because usually museums are so standoffish with their objects. You have to kind of look but don't touch. But the thing about a mare is that you're supposed to keep it warm. You're supposed to keep using it and not just let it go dead. And I think it's really significant that they decided to honor the culture um, as more important than preserving the object itself. Uh, and this is an image I really like. Uh, Northwestern University had a panel about the Pacific Islands, and what better place to hold this panel than inside the mare itself with the ancestors looking out at you. So yeah, I just feel like I should give props to the uh, Field Museum for uh, handling this uh, object with respect and integrity. 
Okay. Okie dokie. Uh, so we are just hop, skipping, and jumping all over the world right now. Uh, now we are going to take a jump over to uh, North America. Uh, so we'll take a look at just one particular example of Native North American art, with apologies to all of the wonderful uh, cultures, all of the wonderful Native American tribes. Uh, we're just going to look at just one piece, and then we'll take another hop and look at a similarly fascinating region of Central and South America, and we're just going to focus on a couple works of art. So apologies to all of these world cultures, which I am just uh, jumping right over. Uh, but I think that you'll still find this first one pretty interesting. All right, so here we have uh, the Great Serpent Mound. Uh, this is in Ohio, uh, just a little bit of, uh, outside of Cincinnati. And um, you can see why it's called the Great Serpent Mound. As you can see, it's about a quarter of a mile or so in length. And uh, it depicts this uh, sort of swirling tail that curls round and round and round and round and around, around and then ends at this head swallowing uh, some sort of orb. Uh, so I'll show you a close-up uh, before uh, in just a second, but first I want to point out that this is one of those cases where it's not so much a question of how it was made as why. Uh, how it was made is no mystery. Uh, it's just a simple mound. It's just uh, rocks and earth just kind of stacked on top of each other, making this uh, long uh, bulge in the earth. And, um, yeah, then over time, grass grew over it. Uh, they have pointed out that its head and mouth uh, point to the sunset on every summer solstice. Uh, so perhaps this is something that has a particular alignment, kind of like Stonehenge does. Uh, but as for what it was specifically used for, um, there's really not a whole lot of other records from this culture. Uh, this was created, as you can see, by the Adena culture. Uh, which also um, is kind of an offshoot of the Hopewell Indian nation, which uh, flourished from the 2nd century BC to the 6th century uh, CE. Uh, this, though, as I said, was made by the later uh, Adena culture. But something that we do know about the Hopewell and the Adena is that snakes, uh, serpents, are associated with uh, fertility and growth and crops and things like that. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, an illustration of what the Great Serpent Mound looks like and uh, perhaps come up with some theories as to what it might mean. Okay, so here's a sketch showing uh, how it's laid out. Um, I already pointed out the curling tail and the swirling body, uh, but then up here, uh, people are kind of split on as to what it represents. So perhaps uh, this is the snake's head and its mouth is open. Maybe it's swallowing an egg. Uh, I've also heard a proposal that it could represent a solar eclipse, a moon being swallowed by a snake. Um, another idea is that perhaps it's not an egg it's swallowing. Maybe that's the eye of the snake and we're sort of looking at it side on. Or maybe that's the neck of the snake and its neck is bulging from where it has already swallowed the egg. Or maybe it's a sort of flaring out, uh, flaring out its hood the way some snakes do. Uh, but it's really hard to say. Um, so a few um, indicators or a few uh, hypotheses about what the Great Serpent Mound is built for and what it represents. Uh, here's a few of my theories. And by the way, I don't have a concrete explanation for what this object was used for because, well, scientists don't have a concrete explanation, unfortunately. So here's a few guesses. Uh, I already pointed out perhaps the um, some sort of solar calendar, perhaps it's an eclipse. Uh, another uh, idea is that maybe the Great Serpent Mound represents the Little Dipper and its tail curls around uh, Polaris, the North Star. Uh, my favorite theory has to do with the fact that, um, well, the object, uh, I mean, the Great Serpent Mound was made around 1070 CE, and in the year 1066, Halley's Comet made an appearance. And by all accounts, this was a very bright appearance of the comet in the sky. It really would have shown up brightly, and perhaps the Great Serpent Mound was built to commemorate uh, this sighting. If it was, uh, it's not the first time that Halley's Comet has appeared in art. It's actually a really interesting subject if you feel like delving into it further. Uh, one of my favorite appearances of Halley's Comet in art is in a fresco by Giotto, 
where it's interpreted to be the uh, the star of, that led uh, the wise men to Jesus, the star of Bethlehem. Um, if it is indeed uh, meant to commemorate the 1066 appearance of Halley's Comet, uh, then it would have been the same Halley's Comet that would have frightened the uh, the Normans. Uh, this is Halley's Comet right here. Uh, this is a segment from the famous Bayo Tapestry, and they saw it um, as sort of good fortune to uh, foretell the Norman conquest of England. Uh, but I think that as far, that's my favorite uh, rational theory. My favorite uh, irrational theory uh, is this one. There's this whole school of thought of scientists and anthropologists trying to find the location of the actual original Garden of Eden. And this one guy, Reverend Landon West, suggested in 1901 that this is it, that this is the Garden of Eden here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and uh, he justified it because of this serpent mound, this uh, drawing on the earth, which he uh, believes was not created by the Native American uh, Adena culture, but rather by God himself uh, as a warning uh, for other people. And he actually found a scripture to back up his claims uh, in the book of Job. By his, hand, by his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Um, now, I'm not sure if this has any uh, real basis in reality, but it certainly is an interesting theory. And, yeah, it's, it is kind of interesting to see where people uh, have placed the Garden of Eden, uh, anywhere from the Middle East uh, to, well, here in uh, North America, even the North Pole, then for no other reason than it's the only place on Earth that hadn't been explored yet, so it's got to be somewhere, so it must be there. Uh, but again, that's just another fun little subcategory of our history. Uh, for the purposes of us, uh, it's just one of many interesting theories about the Great Serpent Mound in Ohio. But let's take a leap down to Central and South America. And of course, we're talking about some wonderfully colorful cultures with really interesting uh, artifacts. And we could spend a whole class just talking about Central and South America. Uh, for the purposes of our class, we're just going to focus on the Maya civilization. But the thing about these um, Central and South American cultures is that um, they can't be discussed entirely in isolation because uh, they just kind of seem to spring up. You have a number of these uh, city-states just popping up and uh, over time sort of disappearing and they uh, cross-reference each other and they influence each other and they're always conquering each other and it's really interesting to look at what they have in common. Uh, so a few things that a lot of these Central and South American cultures have in common are uh, they have similar architecture. The pyramid structures, for example. Uh, they worship similar gods. They have a similar uh, sort of central city plan, a very carefully laid out city that corresponds with uh, celestial patterns. Um, also, many of these cultures have an elaborate calendar, uh, particularly the Mayans. Uh, and what's exciting about the Mayan culture is that it's 365 days long, which makes it um, a nice reference for the Gregorian calendar, which is uh, also 365 days long. Although technically, uh, the calendar year is not 365 days long, is it? It's 365.25 uh, days long, but, uh, well, who's counting? Uh, so we'll kind of just take a look at these uh, cultures, these different sort of cultural indicators, and um, I just kind of want to give you a really broad view and show how they're similar. Uh, but this was uh, really the first great Central American culture, the city of Tehotihuacan, which is about 40 miles north of Mexico City. Um, the Pyramid of the Sun in the city is uh, very large. It's actually larger in area than the largest of the pyramids of Egypt. Uh, however, it's only about half as high. Um, this city flourished and was at its peak in the year 600, and it had as many as 125 to 200,000 residents, which would have made it the sixth largest city in the world. Um, this pyramid uh, marks the spot where they believe that humanity originated. Um, it faces the sunset on August 12th, which is the beginning of time on the Mayan calendar, because the Mayans and also the Azteca, the Aztecs, they looked up to Teotihuacan as a, sort of a holy place. 
Uh, by the time that those uh, cultures were formed, uh, Teotihuacan was pretty much vanished. Uh, the city mysteriously burned in 750, and that just kind of seemed to be uh, the end of that culture. Um, still a mystery as to what happened to uh, to the city and why it burned down and why it was not rebuilt. Uh, but I also want to call your attention real quick to this small slide here on the right hand side. Uh, some relief sculptures on the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. That figure right there. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, as I was saying, uh, the figure here on the left, uh, he is the god of the storms. He kind of has goggle eyes and that funny little grid for a face. Uh, and then the figure over here on the right is the famous Quetzalcoatl. He is the uh, god of the winds and the storms. Uh, he, well, I guess just the god of the winds, because this is the god of the storms, sorry. Uh, but Quetzalcoatl is a serpent with feathers instead of scales. But uh, you'll see both of these deities appear in a number of works of art uh, from Central and South America, including in the Maya. Okay, so we just took a hop down to Guatemala, where we will see uh, the same sort of cultural indicators that we saw in Teotihuacan, the, uh, uh, the central pyramid structures, uh, a lot of the same deities, um, and also uh, a very refined uh, courtly system. Um, and here, I'm going to show you one of the masterpieces of classic Mayan art. All right, this piece is really cool. This is uh, lentil number 24 from the city of Yaxilan, uh, which, as you can see, is between Mexico and Guatemala. Uh, this was produced by the Mayan culture. It's about four feet tall. And uh, a lentil, I don't know if you remember, uh, back whenever I talked about post and beam style architecture, I said it's also sometimes called the post and lentil. Uh, the lentil is the part that goes over the door. So this is like a narrative panel. Imagine walking through a gateway and then making an about face, and there would be a number of panels on the post and above your head on the lintel uh, telling uh, this sort of almost like a comic strip story. Uh, this creatively is called lintel number 24 because it is number 24 in the series. Okay, but it's what it depicts is really cool. And we uh, have a pretty exact notion of what it does depict uh, because recently we've been able to translate the hieroglyphics that appear. So we know that this man here is the king. His name is Lord Shield Jaguar, and this is his lovely wife, Lady Jacques, XOC. Now, this is a sculpture that projects from a flat surface, which you may remember is called a relief style carving, and there are still a few traces of pigment on it, uh, giving us an indication to the beautiful um, artwork that must have flourished uh, here in the Mayan civilization. Uh, they both wear elaborate costumes with tassels and beads. Um, she wears a headdress, and you may look there on the top of the headdress, and you'll see, oh, there's that, uh, that goggle-eyed storm serpent. Uh, on the head of uh, Lord Shield Jaguar is, uh, well, another head. Uh, that's a shrunken head of his enemy. Uh, he holds a torch, and um, this is the fire of the torch, or some sort of flaming spear. Uh, we know from translating the hieroglyphics that this uh, depicts an event that uh, would have been on um, 5 Eb 15 Mach, which can be uh, transposed onto October 28th, 709. So yeah, we just passed it. Um, this, uh, they've noted as a conjunction between the planet Saturn and Jupiter, and also uh, probably commissioned the birth of a son of, uh, from Lady Jacques to Lord Shield Jaguar. But what Lady Jacques is doing right here, she is not giving birth, rather she's doing something a bit more grotesque. Uh, she is kneeling on the ground in front of her husband and she's performing a bloodletting ceremony. Okay, so take a look here in the basket. There are uh, pieces of paper, and there's this long rope, and there are uh, thorns pushed through the rope. And what she's doing is the end of the rope, uh, there is a stingray barb, and so she's used that to pierce her tongue, and she's pulling this rope through her tongue. 
So here you can see her tongue is out. She's pulling the rope through it. And these are the barbs that also pass through her tongue, uh, these thorns. Uh, there are traces of blood along the side of her mouth. And she has to pull this entire rope through her mouth, through that hole in her tongue. And whenever she's pulled it all the way through, she's going to take the papers in that basket and use them to wipe off her face. And um, she is then going to put them back in uh, some sort of fireplace or possibly back, uh, back in the basket. And she's going to light those papers on fire along with uh, some special sacred herbs. And then she's going to breathe that smoke in and the next lentil, lentil number 25, shows what she sees. The storm god, or I'm sorry, the, um, the god of the winds, Quetzalcoatl, comes curling out of the smoke. And out of it appears a vision of uh, possibly one of her ancestors and possibly a god himself. Uh, this is Lady Jacques still kneeling before him. So basically this entire uh, panel, but, well, all of these panels are intended to show uh, just how dedicated the king and queen were to their religion, that she would undergo this painful ceremony. And uh, yeah, it's just such a fascinating culture, the Mayans, and I just love that tongue pulling, the pulling the barbs through your tongue. That's got to be uh, painful. As for the Mayans, though, uh, they vanished by the year 900, and uh, well... The next big culture to come along would be the Aztec. Now, the Aztec civilization, or the Azteca, uh, they also adopted a lot of the cultural uh, indicators that we've already seen, including, of course, the pyramid structure, the calendar system. Uh, they also had sports arenas. They had uh, this wonderfully planned out city that uh, many uh, Europeans said was actually uh, very well kept, actually uh, cleaner and better managed than most European cities. Uh, but they were also rather bloodthirsty and violent and did a lot of conquering of each other's cultures. Um, but uh, if we take a look at one of the objects from the Aztec, uh, here on this vessel we can see a relief carving showing that toothy feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl so all these years later, Quetzalcoatl is still around, uh, just in a different sort of format in all three of these cultures that we've seen. Uh, the thing that would finally end this sort of cycle of cultures in Central and South America uh, would be the Spanish conquest, uh, which conquered the city and pretty much put an end uh, to the Aztec and all the other cultures. Uh, all that's left now are the ruins. But yeah, I think the Mayans were, they're my favorite. How could they not be? All right, last but certainly not least, uh, let's take a hop down to Peru. And there we would find the uh, Inca civilization. Uh, but this uh, work of art that we're looking at here was not made by the Inca. Uh, this was made by the Nazca. But it's part of the same region as the Inca in Peru. Um, and uh, here we can find the famous Nazca Valley. Um, it's very arid out there. Nothing much grows uh, in the Nazca Valley. It's a little bit like uh, like the mountains and plains of Arizona. But if you uh, were to fly over the Nazca Valley and look down, you would see the famous Nazca Lines. These lines that stretch uh, all over the plains of the Nazca Valley and as you can see form distinct shapes. This is a hummingbird. And uh, these lines were made around 5 to 600 A.D., uh, almost certainly created by the Nazca Indians, uh, who flourished in this area from, the, from about 200 B.C. to 600 A.D. Now, how the Nazca lines were made is no great mystery, any more than the Great Serpent Mound was much of a mystery. It's just simply a matter, in this case, not of making mounds, but rather of clearing the topsoil off. Um, if you were to go to the Nazca Valley, there's a sort of layer of dark rocks and pebbles on top. And if you were to dig down a few inches, you would see some lighter stones underneath. So all you have to do is sort of clear this pathway, push uh, the topsoil to the left and right, and you have this very distinct path that shows up.
And they've always known that these lines existed, and they've also been able to tell that they do form shapes. Uh, now this, by the way, this image that we're looking at is not from the Nazca Valley. Uh, this is a, an American who uh, made some Nazca lines on a football field, just uh, using it to illustrate a theory on how it might have been done. I like to show it because it gives you a nice sense of scale. Uh, this is the foot of the condor. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the other shapes that you would see if we were to go and fly over the Nazca Valley. All right, so yeah, it wasn't until people began to fly in airplanes that they realized that these Nazca lines that crisscross all over the plane are actually much more elaborate than initially realized. Uh, so there on the top left forms a very clear shape of the spider. Uh, there below it, that wonderful spiral of the monkey. Uh, there on the top right, I don't know if you can tell what that is. Uh, to me, it looks like a like a little chicken or something, like a rubber chicken. Uh, but those have been called uh, the hands. And then below that is one of the more intriguing shapes. Uh, it's kind of hard to make out in this photograph. Uh, this is roughly what it looks like. I wonder what that could be. He's been dubbed uh, the astronaut, although uh, to be technical, the astronaut was not made by the Nazca, but by the Parkas people. But uh, yeah, there are a number of... Uh